Hello friends, welcome you to this brand new episode of Jix Rapid Journal Review. Methylene blue has been tried as an adjunct in patients because of its yeah. ability to reverse vasoplegia in cardiopulmonary bypass. But it has been almost 20 years that we had only two large randomized controlled trials over the feasibility of its usage in septic shock. So how different is septic shock? How different is vasoplegia in septic shock as against cardiopulmonary bypass, that following CPV bypass? So we are going to discuss on it, but before that, we will listen to this article which is recently published in Critical Care on the use of methylene blue as an adjunct in septic shock in its efficacy in reducing the vasopressor requirements. So here we move on to hear the article from Dr. Pradeep Rangappa. Hello friends, welcome to Jix Rapid Journal Review. So this is the third journal review. So I'll be discussing this interesting article that came, Methylene Blue in Septic Shock. Uh, so I wish to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Dr. Rashekar and Bhavya, who also discussed this journal. So when we look into the sepsis, so we have very few options with regards to maintaining blood pressure. So uh, just looking back and uh, revisiting our definition, it's a life-threatening organ dysfunction due to dysregulated host response to the infection. So what really happens in sepsis is we have a lot of vascular leakage. And when there is vascular leakage, obviously there is fluid deficit. So our understanding is we give fluids. And uh, what we have understood is there is vasodilation also that happens because the nitric oxide metabolism becomes abnormal in sepsis. This leads to vasodilation in addition to a lot of fluid leakage that happens from the vessel, which leads to hypotension, hypoperfusion, and deleterious effects. So the options we have is we give fluids to circumvent this lot of fluid leakage that happens from the blood vessels. And it is shown that only half of the patients respond to the fluid resuscitation that has been given. And the hemodynamic effects that are, that are attained after giving fluids is only transient because whatever fluid is given, it does tend to extravasate and again it uh, reverts back to the baseline. So it is shown from one study that hemodynamic effects last only for about 10 minutes with regards to fluid resuscitation. So beyond this, because there is vasodilation, we use vasopressors. The second option is we use vasopressors. And some of it has shown that increasing the dosage of these vasopressors lead to some deleterious effects. So it can cause arrhythmias and there can be organ ischemia or myocardial ischemia that can happen and some immunosuppression. So these are some of the deleterious effects. Obviously, we use vasopressors, but uh, perpetuating and increasing or cascading the dose of vasopressors can lead to deleterious effects. So that is where we need to have a third option. So we use fluids for septic shock, we use vasopressors, and we use some steroids. But is there a need for a third option? So this is where the whole question of usage of methylene blue comes in. And... Uh, uh, there is a sort of a understanding that one needs to approach management of septic shock in a multimodal strategy to improve the tissue perfusion and at the same time reduce the toxicity of multiple vasopressor uh, that we would be using or using a very liberal amount of fluid because increasingly we have recognized using a lot of fluids also is deleterious using a lot of vasopressors also is deleterious so this is where the context of whether we need a third sort of a drug uh, which can uh, play a role in stabilizing the organ perfusion is uh, is the need of the hover. So to fit into this space is the molecule which is methylene blue. So this is the chemical structure of methylene blue which is a phenothiazine, phenothiazine like heterocyclic aromatic molecule. So that is the molecular structure. And how does methylene blue acts? Because we know how vasopressor acts, we know how fluids help in uh, circumventing the extravasation of the fluid. So we need to understand how methylene blue acts. So the whole concept of uh, vasodilation that happens in septic shock is mediated by nitric oxide, which acts on the vascular smooth muscles. So nitric oxide synthase, I'm sure most of the listeners would know, nitric oxide synthase, which is present, produces nitric oxide. And this nitric oxide leads to activation of soluble guanylate cyclase. 
and this soluble guanylate cyclase leads to production of cyclic GNP, guanylin, guanosine monophosphate, and this leads to activation of protein kinase. So this is the sort of a cascade that tends to set in with nitric oxide. This protein kinase, uh, what it does is basically the, the smooth muscle muscle that contracts is mediated by calcium entry into the calcium channel and the activation of the protein kinase reduces the sensitivity of myosin to contract due to the calcium entry into the calcium channel so there is reduced sensitivity of myosin to the calcium that me gets mediated by this activated protein kinase and there is this calcium sensitive potassium channels which gets activated and this activation of this calcium sensitive potassium channels leads to reduced entry of calcium into the calcium channels. So all this leads to uh, vasodilation due to the dilatation of these smooth muscles. And there is inhibition of calcium release by this endoplasmic reticulum which is present in the muscle. So these are the, some of the changes which I put in pictorially which tends to happen due to activation of protein kinase. So there is reduced calcium entry into the muscle due to the activation of calcium sensitive potassium channels. There's inhibition of calcium released by this endoplasmic reticulum and reduced sensitivity of myosin. So these are the three components which leads to muscle relaxation. So because there is a smooth muscle relaxation in the vascular smooth muscles, vasodilation happens and hypotension sets in. So nitric oxide or the methylene blue acts by inhibiting the nitric oxide synthase and it acts by inhibiting soluble guanylate cyclase. So this is the mechanism of action of methylene. So methylene blue basically acts on this pathway and prevents the relaxation of vascular smooth muscles, thereby preventing vasodilation and deleterious side effects. So this is the mechanism of action of methylene blue. So you can remember this picture to understand how it acts. So there are certain uh, basic science studies done as to how methylene blue has an effect on pharmacodynamics. So way back in 1999, as you see, early studies with methylene blue happened since two decades. So this came from Brazil, where they showed methylene blue in the uh, physiological models does increase the mean arterial pressure. And it was shown to increase the SVRI from baseline. But in 60 minutes, SVRI increases. Pulmonary vascular resistance index also increases in about 20 minutes. Mixed venous oxygen comes down from 65 to 63 in about 60 minutes. And PaO2 by FiO2 reduces with the use of methylene blue in about 40 minutes in this physiological study. And lactate reduced from 5 to 4.5 in this study. With regards to heart rate, filling pressure, cardiac output, oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption, there was no difference with methylene blue. So this was an early physiological study done in from Brazilian authors, we showed these are some of the hemodynamic effects that methylene blue has, and we need certain of these hemodynamic effects in sepsis. We need reduction of lactate, we need improvement in the SVRI, and so on and so forth. The PAO to FIO2 reduction is due to the uh, meth hemoglobinemia that happens, so there is an underestimation of this oxygenation that happens, which we will talk about with, uh, in the later slides. And it is shown that methylene blue at the dosage of one milligram per kg is found to be very safe once we go beyond one milligram per kg uh, uh up to one to two it is okay but more than two milligram per kg it is shown to cause hypoperfusion so any dose after because in the study that we will be talking cumulative dose of 1.2 milligram per kg was used so any higher dose so more than two milligram is something you can keep in mind it causes planktonic hypoperfusion leading to some organ ischemia that can happen. So that is something one needs to bear in mind. So this was a study that came from the German group in 2022, looking at what is the right sort of a dosing that has to be used in methylene blue. So this title of the study was Methylene Blue Dosing Strategies in Critically Ill Adults with Shock. So this study was a retrospective cohort study done from July 2014 to October 2019. So here, uh, they used methylene blue in patients with shock where norepinephrine requirement was more than 0.1 uh, micrograms per kg per minute and lactate use was more than 2 millimoles per liter. So these were the patients where they used methylene blue. So they had 209 patients in this particular study and uh, they used three different dosing patterns. As you see, 111 patients 
got a bolus of methylene blue followed by continuous infusion. 59 patients got only bolus of methylene blue and 39 patients got continuous infusion. So let's uh, focus on this study because the study that we are discussing today, they used only continuous infusion. But in this particular study, which came from Germany only last year, they used these three different doses to see which sort of a dosing had maximum efficacy. So baseline characteristics in these patients, there was no difference. Then they looked at vasopre vasopressor index score. So vasopressor index score, as I have shown here, is only addition of all the vasopressors that was used, dopamine plus dobutamine, and epinephrine and vasopressin and norepinephrine, they multiplied by 100 to derive what vasopressin index score. And they found basically the cumulative need of vasopressors significantly reduced in all three groups. Either you use bolus followed by infusion or infusion or, uh, or only bolus, the need for vasopressor significantly came down. But when they looked at 28-day mortality, that was found to be significantly less in patients who got bolus followed by continuous infusion. It was 53.1% was the 28-day mortality. But when, when in the patient who got only bolus, mortality was 71 and who got continuous infusion, mortality was 74.3%. So which goes to say the type of dosing that we use is going to influence the outcome, at least from this German study if you have to subscribe, because the 28-day mortality was significantly less in this group. And it was shown that in patients with cardiogenic shock or in patients who need higher dose of vasopressors, there was better response to methylene blue. So this was shown in this particular study that anyone who is needing cascading doses of vasopressors or where there is a cardiac dysfunction also, the response to methylene blue was found to be much better. So this was an important message that came from this study that if he was a bolus followed by infusion, they seem to have better effect on the outcome. And patients who are on higher vasopressors tended to respond better to methylene blue. So those were the two high points of this particular study. And the adverse effects, as I said, methylene blue is considered safe in less than 2 mg per kg. More than 2 mg per kg, the uh, vasoconstriction and the organ ischemia can set in. And one of the commonest side effects of methylene blue is this greenish colored urine that tends to happen. So this was found in significant number of patients who got methylene blue. And arrhythmias was also one of the side effects and, and depressed cardiac output and increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance. So these were some of the side effects. And even some of the patients had coronary ischemia when higher doses was used. And renal hypoperfusion is the side effect. And uh, depressed saturation because of the methemoglobinemia that forms, the saturation can be falsely depicted as being low. So these are some of the adverse effects one needs to keep an eye on when methylene blue is being used. So keep the dosage of two milligram per kg in mind. So anything more than two is going to be harmful in a day. So that is something one needs to keep in mind. So contraindications for methylene blue, any hypersensitivity and in G6PD deficiency, methylene blue can cause hemolysis. So one needs to exercise caution with the usage of uh, methylene blue in G6PD deficiency. And it has some drug interactions. It does interact with monoamino oxidase inhibitor and SSRIs. And it does interact with dapsone, leading to production of this uh, hydroxyl amine group, which leads to hemolysis. So hemolysis is something one needs to keep an eye, especially in patients with G6PD deficiency or someone who is on dapsone. So these are some of the things that one needs to keep in mind. So this is about all the background that I've spoken with regards to the information that one needs to have on methylene blue. Now we'll jump into this study, which is uh, what we will focus on in this journal review. So this came, as you see, in 2023. It is a Mexican study. So early adjunctive methylene blue in patients with septic shock and randomized controlled trial. So this was a single-centered randomized controlled trial. Inclusion criteria was they took patients with septic shock who fulfilled the sepsis-3 definition. So the primary outcome they looked at time for vasopressor discontinuation at 28 days. So how much time it took for them to stop vasopressor. Secondary outcome, they looked at vasopressor three days at 28 days. They looked at duration of mechanical ventilation. They looked at ICU and hospital length of stay. 
and they looked at 28 day mortality so these were secondary outcome they looked at so the methods uh, so they took care that uh, enough fluid resuscitation was given and the fluid resuscitation or the fluid responsiveness was determined by our accepted dynamic indices they looked at velocity time integral change of 10 percent with passive leg rising test as a indication for giving fluids and they looked at positive uh, pulse pressure variation of 13 percent as a reason that they had to give fluids and they looked at tidal volume change with a change of 3.5 percent as a reason they should so just uh, put this in the context of the clovers trial that we discussed last week in clovers trial they never used any of these indices to give fluids they only looked at clinical variables but at least in this study where they're using methylene blue the initiation of vasopressures was only happened after adequate fluid responsiveness test that was done and fluid resuscitation guided by these tests, which is good and they started norepinephrine if norepinephrine dose went to more than 0.25 micrograms per kg per minute vasopressin was started at 0 0.03 international as these were all the standard therapeutic uh, regimes that we had we we, uh, we adopt in our icu and they started hydrocortisone 200 mg as an infusion in anyone uh, who are on vasopressors or who are on an increasing vasopressor and this whole uh, dimensions were put in place to maintain map of 65 to 75 millimeter mercury so the sample size was calculated sample size was 88 patients this was to attain statistical power of 80 percent with alpha error of 0 0.05 so this is the statistical methodology they adopted so results so I'll just straight away jump to the results. They took, they enrolled 91 patients. The median age of the patients in this study was 46 years. Interquartile range was 35 to 55. 60% of them were male patients. 46% of the patients had AKI. And the source of sepsis, pulmonary was the main source of sepsis in this study with 49.5% of the patients who had pulmonary as the source of sepsis. And 38.5% of the patients had abdominal as the source of sepsis and antimicrobials or antibiotics were administered within three hours so all this is in keeping in lines with the surviving success guidelines so they adopted all these principles so which means it was a well conducted study so they had this 91 patients and we'll straight away look into the key aspects of the results they looked at time for vasopressor discontinuation at 28 days as you see it was much earlier so the time that was taken to stop vasopressors was much earlier in patients who got methylene blue 45 got methylene blue 46 was placebo it was 69 hours as compared to placebo where methylene blue was not used 94 hours which means in in the group which got methylene blue the vasopressors could be stopped much early on and that attained statistical significance and the dose of methylene blue they used for these patients was 100 mg per uh, in 500 ml normal saline it was given as an infusion over six hours for three days so keep this in mind because when we compare this with the German study, we said that giving a bolus followed by infusion had a better effect on the outcome as compared to only the infusion. Here they gave 100 mg and they took 1.2 milligram per kg as a dose for this study and they and they put it as 100 mg as a ballpark figure. So that was the dose that was given to all the patients. And vasopressor free days, the higher it is, better it is. As you see, vasopressor free days was higher in 20. 23.9 days in methylene blue and 19.5 days in placebo and that also attained statistical significance and so there was a median difference of one day more vasopressor three days was better by one day in methylene blue group and they looked at ico length of stay was significantly less in methylene blue group and the median difference of ico length of stay being less was by 1.5 days in methylene blue so they stayed 1.5 days less in the methylene blue group as compared to the placebo and the hospital length of stay also was significantly less in methylene blue group nine days as opposed to 10.5 days so the median difference was 2.7 days which means they, they stayed less by 2.7 days in the hospital in the methylene blue group so very very optimistic very provocative sort of an outcome where your duration of vasopressors was significantly less Time taken to discontinue vasopressors was significantly less in methylene blue. ICU length of stay, hospital length of stay, which are important secondary endpoints that we looked in any study, were significantly less in methylene blue group. And these were the positive outcomes. They looked at 
duration of mechanical ventilation and mortality, there was no difference between methylene blue and placebo. And they looked at adverse events. 91 patients, as I said, methemoglobinemia is something which is a problem with methylene blue. And methemoglobinemia is shown to be dose responsive or dose related. It all depends on the cumulative dose. So it was 2.9% in methylene blue and placebo it was 0.5%. And this greenish urine was found in almost all patients who got methylene blue. 93% of them had this greenish blue urine. And they looked at all the ejection fraction because we understand the, the, when we give methylene blue more than 2 mg per kg, it can have coronary ischemia, arrhythmias, and depression in the cardiac output. They have looked at ejection fraction. They have looked at acute kidney injury, PAO2, FIO2, amino transferases, and bilirubin. There was no difference of the dose they have given in this study. It was 1.2 mg per kg or 100 mg as an infusion for three days. So basically, they gave 3.6 mg per kg over three days. So that is the cumulative dose that was given in this study. And when you look very carefully into all the tables that are put up in this study, so you would look, they looked at days of mechanical ventilation. If you see the signal is more towards reduction in the methyl, methylene blue group, it was 4.2 to 5.5, 5.1, and almost attains statistical significance. And even if you look at serum lactate at the end of 24 hours, it was much less. The signal was more towards being very less in uh, methylene blue as compared to the placebo and almost attaining statistical significance. So it basically shows maybe uh, if the sample size would have increased, we could have possibly attained statistical significance even here. And uh, these are the baseline characteristics between methylene, methylene blue and the control. As you see, there is no major difference in any of the baseline characteristics. But what is of interest? that I wanted to show is the SOFA score and Apache 2 score in this particular study. Compare this with the CLOVERS trial that we discussed last week. In CLOVERS trial, which was comparing restrictive and the liberal fluid, you saw the SOFA score was only 3. And that was mentioned as a limitation of the study that they took possibly less hickory. Here, if you see, the SOFA study is much higher and even the Apache is much. It means they took all sick patients with uh, septic shock. So it basically reflects about the sickness quotient in this patient, uh, which tends to define that possibly this was a uh, study looking at a sick, critically unwell patients who are on cascading doses of acupressors. And here, if you see the norepinephrine dose, with the blue one is the methylene blue, significantly comes down as compared to the placebo. And if you see this, the dark gray one is the map, which significantly improves as compared to the placebo. So, and this, this is the Kaplan Mayer curve looking at the vasopressor discontinuation. As you see, the vasopressor discontinuation happened much better with the methylene blue group with hazard ratio of 2.7. And as you see, confidence interval was statistically significant. So, so, th so those were all the positive findings that, uh, that was uh, observed in this particular study. So, what are the strengths of the study? One would think that 91 patients possibly is the less number, but compared to all the previous studies, the strength of this is this is the largest study so far. Even with 91 patients with 45 in, in methylene blue group, this is the largest study so far. Let's look very briefly into the previous study. <clears throat> this was a study which had come from Russia, Kirov et al. in 2001. Only 20 patients they looked at, where they used methylene blue at a dose of 2 mg per kg and followed by four hour infusion, maximum they went up to 5.75 milligram per kg. And they found that methylene blue had less death, three versus seven, but it did not attain statistical significance. And duration of vasopressors also was less. Even in that study, about uh, around 20 years back also, it was shown that methylene blue had a favorable effect, but it was a very small study, did not attain statistical significance. This was a study by Turkey, uh, Memis et al. in 30 patients, where they used methylene blue 3 mg per kg, a 6-hour infusion, and they found the methylene blue group had a better map. And this particular study, they did cytokine levels. And it was expected that methylene blue group should have less cytokines. So cytokine levels, they did not find any difference between the methylene blue and the placebo group. So, so what possibly tempered or underwent the usage of methylene blue possibly may have come from this study by Lopez et al. This came from the Spain. This again came in 2001, very big study. It was a very 
enthusiastic study of 797 patients uh, conducted by Spain group. Here they used nitric oxide synthase inhibitor, uh, which is methyl L arginine hydrochloride, which is similar to methylene blue, and they compared with placebo. So this was a hugely negative study where they showed the usage of nitric oxide synthase inhibitor because methylene blue also is a inducible nitric oxide synthase inhibitor. Here they found 10% increase in the 28 day mortality in patients who got this nitric oxide synthase inhibitor due to cardiovascular events. So they had a lot of myocardial events. So the authors argue in this paper, this nitric oxide synthase inhibitor, which is a methyl L arginine hydrochloride, is a non selective inhibitor of inducible nitric oxide synthase and constituent isoforms. So the argument they make is methylene blue is only a selective inhibitor of only inducible nitric oxide synthase, but this nitric oxide synthase inhibitor which was used was a non-selective inhibitor that may have led to more deleterious cardiovascular side effects is what the author subscribed to. And we did see that methylene blue causes reduction in the PO2 FI2. The argument is we deal with patients who have septic shock and ARDS, so it is imperative that we do not want FiO2, PaO2 by FiO2 to go down further. So these are some of the studies which I showed. This was a study by Frank Gatchot et al. where they showed PaO2, FiO2 reduced from 229 to 162, where they used 3 mg per kg of methylene blue over 10 minutes. And uh, this Brazilian study we did show earlier also, where PaO2, FiO2 comes down from 168 to 132, and the dose they used here was 4 mg per kg or 4 hours. In this study, the cumulative dose that was used was 3.6 mg per kg for 54 hours and none of these patients showed reduction in the PaO2 by FiO2. So basically the argument is, so the cumulative dose that is used for a much longer period of time, here the cumulative dose is in this particular study was 3.6 mg per kg or 54 hours. But if you look at the earlier studies, there was this dose 3 mg given over 10 minutes and 4 mg per given over 4 hours. So possibly that may have led to reduction in the PO2 is the argument that the authors make. So this study where they have used over three days, 1.2 milligram per kg did not have any effect on PO2 by FiO2. So what are the limitations of this study? The limitation is it's a single center study and many of these patients who were shifted to ICU were shifted very sick from other departments and the type of treatments adopted for sepsis in the department from operation, from the surgical uh, inpatient, from the medicine inpatient, were quite varied. So there was huge heterogeneity in the in the treatment practices that were adopted in the wards. And this study took many years to complete because of the COVID. There was a lot of interruptions in this study, and this could have a uh, lot of influenced the outcomes that was witnessed in this study. And one uh, would argue that uh, one should have measured any physiological changes that nitric oxide would have caused by measuring cytokines, nitrates and nitrates, this was not measured in this study. And COVID-19 patients were very conveniently excluded and we do not know for sure whether in COVID-19 sepsis patients, whether methylene blue would produce such phenomenal results, we do not know. And another important thing is, although they would say that this is a randomized control blinded, so the blinding was not possible because 93%, almost all patients had this uh, greenish urine. So there was no obvious blinding of uh, methylene blue group versus the placebo group. Uh, so this could have infused certain bias with the way the whole vasopressors were titrated in the methylene blue group is an argument. So these are some of the limitations that authors do uh, subscribe to or uh, do concede to in this particular study. So the conclusions from this study is methylene blue versus placebo, methylene blue patients uh, showed significant reduction in the time needed for discontinuation of the vasopressors and it significantly methylene blue group had reduced ICU length of stay and hospital length of stay. So, so very provocative and very optimistic sort of results that we could see. And the reason we are discussing this journal is because methylene blue is not a standard of care in patients with septic shock who are on vasopressors and we use vasopressors, we use fluid, we use hydrocortisone, but I'm sure many of the, my listeners would agree that we do not keep methylene blue as one of the tool in our armamentarium 
for septic shock. So whether this study will change the practice is something uh, you know which uh, raises our enthusiasm. After all this, so there is one nice meta-analysis which has come from China again in 2022. Efficacy and safety of methylene blue in patients with vasodilatory shock, systematic review and meta-analysis. They have taken 15 studies which has looked all the small. So the largest study is this Mexican study, 832 patients. They have looked at methylene blue plus vasopressor and the only vasopressor group. And if you look, again, very overwhelmingly enthusiastic findings. Mortality, odds ratio was 0.54 in patients who got methylene blue and vasopressor as compared to vasopressor. And if you see confidence interval, statistically significant. So there was the mortality benefit in patients who got methylene blue along with vasopressor from this meta-analysis. And the vasopressor requirement the median difference was significantly less when methylene blue was added to the vasopressor, again, attaining statistical significance. And the methylene blue group had higher MAP, higher heart rate, higher pulmonary vascular resistance, and reduced risk of acute kidney injury. So the conclusions that was made in this meta-analysis was, which I thought I will leave this uh, talk with this uh, meta-analysis, which it, again, uh, overwhelms us with enthusiasm that methylene blue is possibly something that we need to include in our armamentarium. Methylene blue, when added to vasopressors, significantly improves the hemodynamics, reduces the vasopressor requirements, reduces the lactate, and improves the survival. So this was a very provocative sort of a conclusion that was made in this particular meta-analysis. So all in all, so when I look at this Mexican study, when we look at this meta-analysis, it appears uh, very compelling for us that possibly we should consider keeping this in our armamentarium in patients with septic shock after our optimal resuscitation with fluids and after optimal vasopressors. If there is a cascading need of increasing vasopressors that is happening, maybe we should throw in uh, methylene blue is what appears from this study. Maybe we still need larger uh, studies uh, in larger group of patients in a multicentric format to make logical conclusions. So I will leave it to Anirban to make a discussion on this. So thank, thank you, you one and all. So this is a forest plot. As you see, there are around 10 studies which are shown uh, favoring methylene blue. So thank you. Thank you, you Pradeep. Thank you, Pradeep, for your ex excellent deliberation on this important subject. So we, 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 there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of intriguing issues in the study, in particular, particularly the one being the dose as you have rightly mentioned and its contrast and comparison to the doses in which the uh, they have in which other studies have used so what i want to ask i will start the first things first i will want to ask, start asking dr murlidhar that sir when this the use of methylene blue as a means to reverse vasoplegia has come into fog from cardiopulmonary bypass we right. know that in cardiopulmonary bypass the this vasoplegia is short lived. In septic shock, it is much longer lived. Now, yes. the first thing that arises in the mind is that when we should consider it as vasoplegia? Uh, vasoplegia, technically, by, if you go by definition, we need to have a measurement of the systemic vascular resistance and the cardiac index. If the cardiac index is greater than four liters per minute per meter square of body surface area, with a low SVR, that will qualify to be called as uh, vasoplegia, especially if it is not responding to 0.1 or 0.2 microgram per kg per minute of norepinephrine infusion. So my observation in the study is that if they had measured the systemic vascular resistance and the cardiac output, it would have given us a better idea about the cardiovascular status and how exactly methylene blue is uh, helping us on the top of having the patient being given norepinephrine up to 2.25 microgram per kg per minute, plus hydrocortisone and plus vasopressin. All the three agents were given. And what is important in this study is that they have used uh, uh, this uh, methylene blue within 24 hours of uh, starting norepinephrine. If the epinephrine was- Exactly, exactly. Uh, Dr. Murli, I will come to that question, yeah. They have excluded the this thing. So it, it, with reference to cardiopulmonary bypass, patients, uh, the incidence is about 5 to 10%. Please note that it is about 5, it's quite high. 
and in patients who have, who have been on angiotensin receptor blockers, angiotensin receptor inhibitors, and patients on amiodarone, patients who are in class four, these patients are likely to develop vasoplegic syndrome following cardiopulmonary bypass. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Mundi. Now, do we have Dr. Vishwanathan here? Dr. Vishwanath is there from Australia. No, is he's he not there. there. Sharmil okay. is there. Dr. Madhavi, Dr. Madhavi is there from well, I, I move on to, I move on to, we will we come back to them later. I will move on to Ajit. That well, Ajit, the, again, the question that comes to our mind, the next is that these patients, in these patients, this drug, the methylene blue as an adjunct was started within 24 hours. So it, it, it may not be confirmed whether they actually had vasoplegia. So this benefit or this, uh, this effect, it may be a chance finding. What do you think? Yeah, please unmute yourself, Ajit. Is two twenty-four hours? So, so that, that, so that is. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. but only, 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 only when you assume that you know the presume that they have vasoplegia is that these patients were on high inotropes, you know, high inotropes requiring you know even uh, no, I mean vasopressin. After you know, a particular point, 0.15 milligram per kilogram of noradrenaline, the vasopressin is added. Still, the blood pressure is on the lower side. Yeah, then only it's, you know, the blood blood has been added. So, we perceive that you know, the overall, you know, the background of septic shock, which is a, there is a definite vasodilatory component after the initial resuscitation, no, after the hypogonemia. What I'm asking you, so, asking you yeah. they, they, we know that they have used vasopressin in a dose of 0 0.06 units per minute. And in that use, but do you think that if they could have, how can we say that if they would not have waited for a little longer time, probably the vasopressin would have given the due effect? Right, right. That's why. I yeah, use... that is that is there. That is always there. Yeah, that possibly that possibility is always there. Yes. The the, the, the the important question. Another. I'm moving on to the next intriguing issue, Doctor Pradeep. If you are there, you can take it, or I will also pass on to. Well, we, we have uh, Jay Prakash also has joined in the panel with us. I will go to you first that when we talk about the dose in this study, in contrast to the previous studies, they have not used any bolus dose. They have used a continuous infusion over a period of six hours, right? Mm -hmm. Now, they have used 100 mg in all patients, irrespective of their body weight, yes. and diluted in 500 ml of normal saline over a period of six hours. Right. And that they have went into use daily for three consecutive days. Now, how how do you support this on the basis of evidence? Uh, so, Anirpam, that's a good question. So, if you no. read the message... No, no, then, unlike... Uh, unlike uh, yeah, yes, yeah, there is... Question to Pradeep. Question to Pradeep. Uh, 1.2 yeah. milligram per kg is what they have kept it as a ballpark. And I think Mexicans with their body habitus, they have rounded it off 100 mg. Suppose if they were very less, then they have possibly given less than it for this. So, uh, so but definitely more than 2 milligram uh, per yeah, day was found to be toxic in most of the studies. So given that to understand, so they have tried to adopt the safer dose. And uh, and it is the cumulative dose effect that uh, methylene blue seems to have uh, bearing on Anirban. So it is not a uh, sort of a titratable dose and it is not something that when we are using it, the side effects do appear. So it is sort of a cumulative dose that tends to have a bearing on all the side effect profile is my so, understanding. So, so as rightly you have said, Ajit, again, I'm going to you. I will go to Dr. Murli mm -hmm. on, on this question again. See, I, I go yeah. back to the Lopez study in which they had used a yeah. similar drug, which was which was inhibiting both yeah. the inducible nitric oxide synthase and the constitutive nitric oxide synthase, as a result of which, which, which was found to have more deleterious effect because it, it hampered or the, the already hemostasis. Now, is it possible? Is it possible that the same thing may happen when, with methylene blue when in a higher doses because the previous studies used both loading as well as continuous infusion. This study only is infu in a continuous infusion. So as a result, a lesser cumulative dose occurred and therefore the, the, the presumed benefits were obtained. Ajit, you want to take that? Or else so the, the vaso, yes, the vasoplegia. Yeah, 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 so that's it, the, the vasoplegia and the cardiopulmonary bypass. That is, you know, obviously we all know it is lasting only for a few hours. And it says to be inflammatory response syndrome. Obviously, need not be an infection Absolutely. there. Absolutely, right. we, 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 we,
Yeah, that's the thing. So, so when it comes to the septic patient, I mean, obviously the septic shock, unlike you know the vasoplasty, that is going to last for a longer time. So that is one reason the orders say that you know they extend it for you know, three 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 days you know, instead of you know single dose in you know, a single dose sort of thing. They extend the the treatment for three days. Doctor Morley, can you can you improve upon the the question? Yeah, the thing is. Uh... Without having a measurement of a systemic vascular resistance, I will I will be a bit hesitant to say that methylene blue actually helped these patients because we do not know what was the SPR at the point of starting the methylene blue infusion because these patients were already getting norepinephrine reasonably stiff dose plus uh, hydrocortisone, which That's actually important. improves the vascular reactivity to administer catecholamines and also vasopressin. So uh, I would think, and what was the cardiac output? They have measured the ejection fraction and said that the ejection fraction is good. But what was the cardiac output? Uh, we have no clue in this study. So I would uh, investigate the findings with uh, cardiovascular monitoring and then make a conclusion. That's well, well, I, I get your very point. Valid, I get your, very valid point. I, so, I get your point, but I asked you, Dr. Jay Prakash, you know that the measuring cardiac index and cardio the systemic vascular resistance may not be possible in all possible settings. Now, if you see the from the study, if we get the ultimate result, a good end uh, that the dose of the vasopressors and inotropes are getting reduced, if the effect itself, does it really matter that whether we measure cardiac index and SVR or not, Jayaprakash? Yes, yes, we should take care of that one because... <clears throat> In this study, what they did exactly, they measured the passive leg raising, uh, static dynamic measures they have taken. But uh, if you are supposed that uh, we don't have idea. No, that was for fluid responsiveness. Look, that was for fluid responsiveness. And yeah. that they did thrice a day, even when the patients were on vasopressin, even the patients were on methylene blue, to check for the fluid responsiveness and accordingly titrate the fluid. That had no bearing on the effect of methylene blue per se. No, yeah. on the case of it, I agree. This uh, I... seems to help. But to be scientific, we need the core evidence. That's my point. That that is that's really, it, it's it's a valid point. The another important thing is is that when we talk about methylene blue in this particular in the question of septic shock and the time and the duration, I I I I, I some I was when we when we compare it in terms of the other studies, do you think that? Uh, the, the exclusion of a lot of patients because in this study they had enrolled 318 patients and some 200 odd patients were excluded because of the varying reasons so ultimately they were left with uh, although the sample size was bad sample size they uh, was 88 and uh, patients were 91 so bad but do you think that that eliminates a lot of patients who would have otherwise qualified and the and the results would have been more more transparent. Ajit, I yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. That, uh, even I myself was telling as a as a micro criticism, you know, around three hundred and eight patients, you know, they suspected, and they recruited. You know, the, I think they wanted a number of around eighty eight. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the sample size was eighty eight. They made it ninety two, and then obviously, you know, one or two attrition happened. So that's what you know, three hundred and eight three hundred and eight patients they of suspected. You know, to have the septic shock, you know, finally they, you know, they could, they, they could recruit only, you know, 92 patients, you know, the, so for only 46 patients, almost 46 in each arm was, you know, randomized. So that could be a sort of, you know, micro criticism or in a micro loophole of this study. I agree with you. There is, a, there is something we need more details to, you know, opine about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Before, before we are already running out of time, but Anil, man, there are two questions in the chat box. box. Yeah, we have a few questions the, in the chat box. I'm taking it. And, and uh, Ashwini, Kumar, that, Ashwini Kumar is asking, just one minute. Ashwini Kumar is asking the mode of action and the protocol. And Aji, uh, Pradeep has already explained it during his presentation, uh, Ashwini, that the mode of action, to repeat again, that the mode of action is the inhibition of the inducible ni nitric oxide synthase and the soluble one light cyclase. And that's why it reduces the rays of the GMP level is affected. And as you can see, he has given a elaborate description. You can just go through it once again. And the protocol which they used in this study was in a, in a dose of, they used 100 in, in 500 level of normal saline and gave it over an infusion of six hours for three consecutive days. And 
there are other also we don't have a given same protocol for everyone this is the one which they used in the study the next question comes from nikhil even though nitric oxide cytokine levels were not measured in this study extrapolating from a previous study which showed no significant difference levels would measuring no levels matter well nitric oxide levels measurement is not an easy job but uh, well <laughs> it's definitely going to matter we make things uh, better for us but the technicalities may, may be even much more difficult. Moving on to the next question, uh, Jacob asked that, sir, if one has to use methylene blue in septic shock, will you start it early or as a rescue? And what does? Well, that is a very interesting question. I leave it to Pradeep that if you have to use methylene, would you use it early like this study where they have used it within 24 hours? They are, or you use it at a later stage when you exhaust all your resources and you are confirmed that the patient is in actual vasoplegia. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Jacob, it's a good question. If you have to look into the spirit of this article, even here they have started when norepinephrine has gone to more than 0.25 and vasopressin had to be in instituted. I think that is when they have adopted the starting of methyl methylene blue. So possibly my thought would be very similar where I'm maxing on uh, noradrenaline, where I've gone to little above the acceptable levels and I'm initiating vasopressin. Maybe that is where possibly I will think of, but before I embark on using it as a routine, I would do it as a part of a study. In fact, before this meeting, we were embarking on doing one study within our city between four to five hospitals and seeing how our patients uh, behave to this. And I would do it as a part of a study initially, Jacob, and then possibly draw logical conclusions. Next question, I think Dr. Murli will take the Nikhil ask that. Dr. Okay, Anirban, okay, Anir, Anir, there is one more thing to add, actually. You see, the studies have shown that there is a different frame of, you know, the upregulation, upregulation, downregulation of these enzymes, you know, this inducing nitric oxide synthetase and, you know, the, the downstream enzyme, whatever the, the guanylate, guanylate cyclase. So basically, the, up, the, up, up, the you know, the the upstreaming and you know, the, the, the downstreaming is happening. So you need to, unless you use it in the, within the particular time frame, they, some of the studies have made it some kind of eight hours time of frame. Initial eight hours, there will be some kind of upper, upper regulation is happening of the you know, first eight hours, then you know, down regulation is happening again, upper regulation is happening. Obviously, because you, if you don't use it in the right time frame, because I'm not telling even, I'm unable to tell, tell anybody like, you know, which is the right time frame. Unless you use it in the right time frame, May not be it may not be useful as well. No, it, it's very in that context only if you are able to monitor some parameters, it may be more helpful. Sorry, sir. I, it's difficult to f fix a particular time, but still, uh, if, uh, broadly speaking, I, I, I did, I, I did for all the lis uh, listeners. I think the best parameter to monitor, as Kanchi Murli sir has rightly said, is cardiac uh, SVRI and uh, cardiac, cardiac index, index. Uh, would be the right way to approach it hmm, for this yeah. molecule. Doctor Murli, the next question is coming for you. From Nikhil asked that will the amount of fluid administered be a surrogate of the measure of SVR visa via stressed or an unstressed volumes? Amount of fluid administered as a surrogate measure of SVR. Can we can we consider it? Amount, I think it's no amount of fluids administered as a surrogate of SVR. Uh, the possibility is that if we are doing uh, the uh, short axis view of the LV and you are able to demonstrate. Uh, reduced the uh, end systolic area, but preserved end diastolic area, that indicates that patient is vasodilated. So the if you are giving fluids and then trying to assess the, the vasodilatory state, uh, this may be one of the parameters which can be used. Okay. So Sir, one important point, Anirban, I want to make, uh, which, uh, which possibly will throw a conundrum into this is, in the German study, Murli, sir, this is basically yes, yes. addressing your cardiac output issue. In fact, when they looked at the subgroup, they found that the patient with myocardial dysfunction, where there was a myocardial depression, these patients uh, responded much better to methylene blue and uh, as compared to the ones without myocardial. So again, this uh, raises a question that maybe like initially, if you look, dopamine was considered very good for cardiac, but not good for sepsis. But when they did subgroup analysis in that SOAP study, they found dopamine was increasingly beneficial in actually, it was increasingly detrimental for cardiac patients. So methylene blue here is uh, in the German study, they showed it is appearing superior or the effect was more profound in cardiac patients. 
Uh, so still more studies with cardiac output. More, more studies are definitely required. Very more, but very interesting. Yeah. But but most most of the studies have at least found one thing that it is the sparing of the catecholamine that is causing the benefit because the yes. greater use of catecholamine is leading leading to organ dysfunction and finally leading to multi organ dysfunction. So that's where its benefit is lying. And it, maybe it has a direct effect, maybe it doesn't, but definitely higher doses have been found in most of the studies to cause the cardiac toxicity with methylene blue. Now, mm -hmm. moving on to, if, is Jay Prakash there or he has left? JP? Well, yes, I, I go, on to, go on to Ajit to ask this question. Ashutosh Singh asks, can it be used before introducing vasopressin? He means that after you use the norepinephrine and reach your whatever may be your 0.25 or 0.3, whatever may be your threshold. Can you use methylene blue instead of uh, vasopressin? People haven't used it, but can it be done? Yeah, based on the current evidence, I won't be able to answer that. I won't be able to answer the question. It can be used, it can be used, but based on the current evidence, I don't have anything to support my statement. No, no, actually, it doesn't support that whether there is actual vasoplegia or not. If you have not uh, tried with vasopressin, so the, the, the vasoplegia may not have actually occurred. So you're, uh, if one has only used a single inotrope, so probably that leaves a lot of space and, and leaves. So I, I think we have we have answered Dr. all the Sharmili questions. Sharmili is there. You want to throw in any question to Sharmili? Is there? Yeah, Sharmili, if, if any question, Sharmili, you are. Hello, thanks for uh, making me a panelist on that. I, I actually, uh, my network is not so great here, but nevertheless, I think it was an excellent discussion. My only comment would be like during the COVID time, we heard of methylene blue as one of the, you know, you know drugs that is being used to prevent or uh, um, the transmission of COVID or in the cure of COVID as a therapy. It was in a very experimental stage and one of the centers in Maharashtra actually used it. So um, is there, has there been any studies or any, you know? No, actually, Sharmili, we or... have seen, if this has been raised. And if you see the previous studies, one of the findings, Dr. Murli, you will be able to, that it has been found to drastically reduce the PF ratios. And that was, that had become a concern. It is in this, in the discussion portion of this, article also they have mentioned that in two studies where there was a drastic fall in the pf ratio and which which led to the but, but is that pf is that pf ratio a reflection PF ratio. of your hemoglobinemia PF ratio. is causing a artificial uh, reduction of uh, that would that you that that would be something possible no 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 see there were both proponents and uh, uh, the, the, the what they tried to say is that in ards already the, there can be deterioration anything but the point was also that uh, methylene blue after its use the pf ratio fell down drastically in these two studies no, not hmm. in severe covid in the mild and moderate in the special in the mild not in COVID. this study not in this study so you know here in this study we, we are considering two different things but one we are considering septic shock and in covid we are considering in the ards so if you go into the ards stage probably it has no role if you are considering septic shock no, no, and no, no, vasoplegia, no, no. it can be used as a cat for its catecholamine sparing effects. So, if there are uh, no no further questions, even in this study, study even in this study, can it be used in pregnancy? I am not sure about that, Anirban. I think safety studies have no, not no, been mentioned in any of the. No, it, it, can, it cannot be based on the current whatever the yeah. No, it cannot be used in pregnancy at this point of time. Yes. In this study, they have excluded pregnant patients. They have excluded. We cannot yes, yes. Yes. No, not only in this study, the, uh, the previous study to this, that the, the Lopez study with the Spain, Spanish study, which Pradeep was mentioning, they also excluded right, the right, right. pregnant patients. So, yeah, you know, it, is, it is definitely contraindicated in pregnancy at this point of time. Yes. So, we will we will have the last word from all the panelists. If Jay Prakash is not there, so we could have started with him. Else, I will start with Ajit. What is your last word or the final take home from this paper yeah, and if, the discussions, whatever we yeah, have? If I, can, if I can just modify Nilban, the last word, whether they would include it in their armamentarium. Okay. Yes, Ajit, in the armamentarium of Aster, will, will there be an additional weapon in the from, from methylene blue? The men from blues. Yeah. <laughs> Ajit. Ajit, the question is to you. I think Ajit's having a uh, unstable ne network connection. Dr. Murli, can you take that? Yes, yes. because of the fact that uh, use of methylene blue can be associated with reduced 
catecholamine administration, uh, I would st uh, consider having it in my armamentarium, certainly, and use it when indicated, going by the hemodynamic parameters. Thank you. I mean, Hi, Dr. Adipan, you asked me something? Yeah, yeah, Ajit, what there is- There is a lot of disturbance in hearing. Yeah, what is your final message from this study as pro and from all the discussions that we had so far? The final crux of the, uh, of the discussions that we have according to you regarding this yeah. use at the no, so, point. Yes, yes. Yes, please yes, go yes. ahead. We are yes. So basically, yeah, basically, basically what I'm understanding is that uh, for having a lot of, you know, even the neurodrenaline, which is the background choice, you can have a lot of dyspnias, you can have immunosuppression. Basically, the catecholamine means has been uh, known to be associated with an increased multi-organ dysfunction. You can always say that the patients who are much sicker with multi-organ dysfunction is requiring more catecholamine. You can always argue that. But, you know, this concern is there. So, I look at, you know, this uh, baso as a catecholamine sparing even like in a vasodilator you know, steroid and even at this point of time even though the doctor pradeep obviously there is no benefit in both hand but what i need to say that just like steroids it makes a rapid relatively rapid rapid resolution of shock that is what which is attracting to me okay. Okay. so that may mean yeah yeah based on this mean yes i would like to use this in a preferably you know Okay, thank you, thank you, Ajit. I, I go to I go to Pradeep now for the last words. Milk break, low grade body weight plus passive pressure. I add, I will add that. Yeah. Yeah, Pradeep, your last yes. words. Yes, Anirban. So for me, the key to include any drugs in my practice is whether it's absolutely safe. So at least from this study, I can understand with that dose, uh, I think it is safe. And the second thing is the cost. So as I understand, the cost is uh, very uh, is not too much at all. So that is something we can and is it easily available? So all three are yes, without causing much harm. And as a measure, when all the routine tools are being exhausted, yes, I will include in the armamentarium. But I'll do very close observations uh, and as a part of the study as well when I initially use it. And Murli's sir point is extremely valid that I would use some cardiac output variable to see what my SVRI is doing and what my other cardiac index variables are doing whilst using it. Friends, a lot of therapies have been tried for rescue in septic shock, and particularly when it is refractory hypotension, there are two little resources that one can think of. Probably methylene blue will have some way to heal this task in this onerous journey and help us revive some of the patients whom we find it difficult with all other gadgets that are presently available. Thank you for being with us. We will be back again next Saturday, next weekend for yet another rapid journal review with Jix. Till then, from all of us in the desk, Shubharatri, Shavar Khayat, good night. Thank you. Thank you, Anirban. Thank you, Murli, sir. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, all the esteemed attendees. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.